Today's chemical engineer, shaped by Sir Frederick Warner. Ben, please. Thank you very much, Ben. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm sure everybody's all heard this saying, there's uh, three things that make a good audience. Uh, they need to be intelligent, need to be well-educated, and a little bit drunk. So uh, thank you very much for the organizers for having the drinks reception beforehand. I appreciate that. Um, it really is a pleasure and an honor to be here tonight, um, uh, to be able to receive this award and to be able to talk in front of, uh, of, of a list of so many impressive people um, uh, to celebrate the, the life and the work of such an impressive man. Um, now, I'm at slight disadvantage. I'd never met Sir Frederick before. Um, and I've only met one person uh, before this evening who had actually met him before. That was uh, Miles Seaman, who uh, sat in the audience tonight. And Miles tried to help me out, but uh, all he said was, the one word I can think of that describes him is iconoclastic. And I don't think that means that he went around destroying religious imagery. Um, <laughs> I think the, uh, as we talked a bit more, I, I, I probed Mars a little bit, and he said that it's, it was his design not to accept the status quo, to change things, and to change things for the better. And so I did my, uh, did my research, and what I've tried to pull out tonight, hopefully, is, uh, it, it is a genuine look at how I feel about chemical engineering today, and I think from what I've heard so far this evening from, uh, from Peter and from others, uh, reflects what Sir Frederick thought. And you can see there, we can shape the future, but our present is shaped by those who came before us. And I think that's quite pertinent, looking at what we've got now and, uh, and, and what Sir Frederick's done before. Um, so just a quick look, really, at, uh, at his uh, life and what he did. Um, studied chemistry at the University College London, as we've heard. Um, recognised the error of his ways uh, and went on to do a postgraduate diploma in chemical engineering. Sorry, I had to get that little dig in for my brother, but I realise there's more chemists in the audience tonight than, uh, than there were before. And it's nice to see Martin talking about the, uh, the, the links between chemical engineering and chemistry. Uh, um, I'm a chemical engineer and my brother studied chemistry at Warwick and was, uh, was kind enough to nominate me for, uh, for the prize and get me through. And Martin, I'm going to have to talk to you afterwards and find out where you got that tie because I think that's going to make the perfect Christmas present for Mark. For, uh, for those who didn't see it, it's the periodic table on a tie, which is wonderful. Um, and uh, you can see that, that I think what I first started to get uh, reading the background on, uh, on Sir Frederick or Ned uh, was the scale of things he was involved in. It's, it's said in the, uh, some of the things I've read about him, he took his diploma twice because he failed it the first time. But that wasn't a bad thing. That was for the sheer number of things that he got involved in while he was doing his diploma. And I think that's a wonderful thing. To be able to do lots of other things, I have to say my, uh, my marks at university dis, uh, suffered a little bit because I was out not just enjoying myself as my father thinks I was, I was getting involved in other things. I was broadening and trying to see what else was out there, what else could we do. Um, and then I think as we move on and look at, uh, look at his development and what he went into, the work he did, the various jobs as a chemical engineer, uh, Kramer and Warner, have, as we've heard about, setting up his own consulting company, a huge variety of work. And then the recognized expert, his work on the Thames flow modeling, um, wind scale, Flixborough, as we've heard, and, uh, and Chernobyl. And again, it shows the real uh, breadth of knowledge and, and, and the real range that he went into in his work. And I think, I mean, the list of his achievements and the incredible things he's done, this is, this is what really inspired me, was looking at it. And, you know, the, the medals, the Leverhulme Medal, Buchanan, Gerald Peel Award. But then looking at the other things, the European Foundation of Engineering Institutes, president for there, setting up the volunteers for ionizing radiation. It wasn't enough just to do one single thing, just to look in one area. He wanted to do others. He wanted to expand and be the best that he could be and look at other things. And I think his involvement in the Royal Society and the Ro and, uh, founding of the Royal Academy of Engineering, again, is a real testament to this. It wasn't just about the chemical engineering. It wasn't just about specialization within certain fields. It was about more than that. And I think that's where I'd like to focus this evening and what I see as the roles of chemical engineers today and, and looking a bit more into that. So I think we all recognize, or, or, or we should all know, um, the process of becoming a chartered engineer, a professional engineer. You have your knowledge, your learning at the start, your education, which develops and gives you the theory behind 
what you're going to go on and do. And that should be a continual process, that goes throughout. And on top of that comes your experience, looking at the chemical engineering work, looking at leadership, looking at working across the disciplines and working with people. And then that goes on then for you to become a professional engineer, a chartered engineer, someone who should hopefully be held in very high regard. But it doesn't stop there. You don't write, I'm a professional engineer and that's it, there we go. It's the continual development on from that, so developing yourself, widening your range and bringing more onto it. And again, in the context of what I've just said, I'd like to look at, uh, at Sir Frederick's life and, uh, uh, and his work and how I think he set the standards, or at least embodied the standards in each of these areas, and how that reflects on chemical engineers today. So to start off with, I think one of the key things I picked out was the, the need for chemical engineers to be multi-skilled. It's not just about specialisation, it's about working in a number of areas. And I think this came from looking at a wide range of issues, looking at broad scientific knowledge. So again, as I said, not just specialised in one area, but looking in a number of different areas. And then looking at these in different environments, different pressures that come on it. We've heard it tonight, the food industry, water, energy, the many different forms of energy within that. And being able to adapt and work in these different areas to ultimately provide a solution. Because I think that's what I saw as well. You can see a lot of academics and, uh, uh, and people who don't necessarily move us forward. And I think that's a key thing that Sir Frederick always wanted, that there has to be a purpose. There has to be a solution that we're driving towards. And as engineers, that's a key thing we have to push for. We're looked to by the general public to provide solutions. We're looked at because we are helping the future, we're generating that future and hopefully making it a better place. So are we meeting these standards? Well, I think first of all, um, a quote from a, a, a man who I'm very interested in, he's not a scientist or an engineer, he's a, a management consultant, kind of, but he's a very high regarded one, a man named W. Edwards Deming. And he said that experience by itself teaches nothing. He said that without theory, Experience has no meaning, and without theory, one has no questions to ask. Hence, without theory, there is no learning. And I think that's important, because I've heard the phrase a few times, oh, who's this young lad? Straight out of university, he doesn't know anything. And often it can almost be seen as a bad thing that I've spent all this time in university, obtaining a degree, and where's my experience? And that may be true. I've been in the industry now, the nuclear industry, for 10 years, five of that while I was working at university, and I know I still have a long way to go, I still have a lot to learn. But without that base of education, without that base of theory, how am I going to be able to answer the questions? So I looked a little bit more at what chemical engineering provides and looking through the course, picking up the Bible that always sits on my desk, Perry's Chemical Engineering Handbook, and what's in there, the topics and the range that's in there. And I think that's key, you'll see the range, only a few of them mentioned here, but the chemistry, heat transfer, fluid flow, looking at civil engineering, economics, uh, uh, mechanical engineering design, all these things. I think our courses are perfectly tailored in education to give us this wide range, this broad knowledge base that we need to be able to ask the key questions. And why am I putting such focus on that? We heard earlier, I think it was uh, uh, Amanda mentioned about innovation. And an innovation is going to be key to how we shape the future. And I've always, also heard said in the past that the worst enemy of innovation is specialization. And that resounded quite, uh, quite loudly with me because I don't consider myself a specialist in any particular area. I have things that I know I have a greater knowledge in more depth of, but I consider myself to be an engineer. I consider myself to be wide ranging. And going back to the previous side, slide, I consider myself to be somebody who can come up with solutions. And I consider myself that because I look at a wide range of things. I don't like to focus too much on individual specific areas. I like to try and keep that innovation going. And I think that's why innovation is so often linked with chemical engineers. Because we have that grounding and we have that base to be able to do that. It gives us adaptability and flexibility in a world which cries out for it. The world is changing very, very fast, and the chemical engineer needs to be able to fit into that. And this is where it all starts, with that knowledge base. So moving on a bit further, I talked about 
uh, multi-skilled and how I saw that uh, Sir Frederick looked for that multi-skilled aspect in what we do. And I think what that gave was the ability to cross-divide. And I think the Royal Ca Academy of Engineering really shows that. The fact that it's joining together the different in, uh, engineering disciplines, bringing it together and working as a discipline known as engineering. It's not mechanical, it's not civil, it's not chemical, it's bringing it all together. And I think what it brought there, you can see in the top left, the science and engineering disciplines bringing it together, looking at the individual skills and the knowledge that we have in those different disciplines, and how do we get that to work as one for the common good. But not just that, not just focusing on engineers and scientists. Down in the bottom right there, the public, media and politicians, we can't forget them because they will drive everything, particularly the public. And we have to consider our image as, science, as scientists and as engineers. What is our image? What do the public see of us? And therefore, what are the media and the politicians going to portray us as? And that's very important. And that goes on to the bottom left there, events and education. And I think what we need to see in, in, in what Sir Frederick looked at and what things like the Royal Academy are trying to do in is how we bring unity, understanding and closer working between the different disciplines. Because we need to present a strong unified front. And as I said, how do we use the strength and skills effectively of those different areas to give ourselves the solutions we were talking about? And developing that understanding and acceptance in doing so, we're all giving the same message, we're all driving to the same thing, that's going to get the public on our side and working with us. And again, developing that continual learning, that continuing understanding of what we do and how we're going to take this world forward and meet the challenges that it is going to continue to throw at us. So how do I think we, uh, we stack up to that today? Well, I'm going to focus on the area that I know best, which, as I said, is the nuclear sector and the, uh, the energy sector. And I think... It's interesting because I, I, I work closely with uh, what we call our discipline chairman within EDF Energy, looking at the chemical engineers that we have within our industry, um, within EDF Energy and the company, and how we work together and what areas we work in. And what we found is the areas we work in are extremely varied. You know, chemistry, engineering, industrial safety, environmental safety, operations, nuclear safety, maintenance, in the decommissioning, in the fuel preparation, as we've heard before. They all work together in these different areas. And what I find interesting is that I can understand my brother when he talks in his strange chemistry talk about uh, what's going on uh, inside the cooling water systems and the corrosion. I can work with the operations guys. I know the different processes, and I know what we can do to try and help make their processes smoother so when they're out there on the plant, it's going well. I can work with the industrial safety and the environmental people, recognising what the issues are. And I think the more I thought about this, the more I realised it's not necessarily just chemical engineering. This is professional engineers. This is what we're working towards, is putting a professional engineer in the middle there and being able to combine these skills to, to operate safely and effectively. And I often say that, I often say that to, to people, I'm a chemical engineer by training, I'm a nuclear engineer by profession. And I'm proud of that. And the reason I say that is because when you actually look at, at what I do, which is nuclear generation, the chemical engineering within that is quite easy. Fluid flow, heat transfer, a bit of corrosion and chemistry going on there. And I think there's a bit of physics thrown in somewhere, but I'm not too sure about that. But, but uh, what I feel is that it... It encompasses more. I don't want to set myself out as a chemical engineer. I want to be a nuclear engineer. That's somebody of a discipline, of a background, but who's able to work with all of these people and who's able to do it in an environment and an industry which I mentioned before about public image is very threatened by public image. We've seen it around the world recently. And we need to be able to set out this unified front and work together on that basis. So moving forward, I think the, the final key area I'd like to look at from uh, Sir Frederick Warner is the focus on excellence. And I think that was clear to see in all he did, and particularly uh, associated with safety, with protecting the public, and with protecting the environment. And I think you can see this in the fact that he worked on issues like uh, Flixborough, uh, like Chernobyl, and like Windscale. And he was renowned, he was an expert, and called into these areas to look at what went wrong. And, and to look at how do we not make these mistakes again? How do we go about making sure that we protect people and we protect the environment? 
And I think some of the, the phrases that have come out that I've seen around the engineering is achieving the best possible outcome considering all these eventualities. As it says, they're protecting the public and the environment as a core of what we do. The care and attention to detail and an inability to accept anything less than excellence. And again, I look back to the, uh, the nuclear industry and, and, and where I sit and the people I see around me on that front. And, uh, and, and it was very important to me. I'm very proud to work in that industry because I see it not just in the chemical engineers. I see it in all the engineers, all the scientists, and all the people who don't have a technical background working around me, that they're proud to be in that industry and they're proud to have the safety of the public and the safety in, of the environment at the forefront of their mind. And I think that stems from the initial nuclear safety, which is often a big focus for everybody, because that's the easy thing. Everyone says nuclear safety, that's where it is. And the effort and the drive that we put into that across the board. But also looking wider, looking at the industrial, the environmental safety, and not forgetting the sustainability side of it. Again, we're looking to the future. How do we protect the future as engineers? Looking at that continual learning we talked about, the organizational learning, the culture, that's instilled in people. Engineering isn't just a job, it is that way of life. It's something that you want to do, that you're driven to do, and it's something you can't get away from. My brother and I drive my wife mad with the things we do, looking at safety, the way we do things, the checking, the double checking. It's always there because it's instilled into us. It's not something we go home at the end of the day and forget about it. And I'm sure everybody sitting here feels that way too. It's a calling for us. It's not just about the fast cars and the chicks that we get into engineering. It's about more than that. Um, and I think, as I said before, you know, particularly in the nuclear industry, we have to broaden ourselves. We can't sit and rely on our technical knowledge and looking at what we can do as engineers. We have to communicate what we do. We have to extend beyond the natural boundaries of working in our environment, working on our plant, and talking to the public educating, developing that understanding, the awareness and the transparency. And I think again that's where it's key when we talk about crossing divides. It's not just about us working with the Royal Society, with the other engineering disciplines. It's about working with those non-technical people. How do we let them understand what we can do and encourage them to come and join us in what we do? Because without them we won't be moving anything forward. And I think finally, in terms of the, uh, the standards we set, and you could see this in all the work uh, that Sir Frederick did, and, and I've taken some bits from the uh, Royal Academy of Engineering's ethical principles, and, and I think this is important um, because it relates to our image. It relates to how are we seen as a profession, as engineers, how do people see us? When I say I'm, I'm an engineer, does somebody look at me and go, oh, does that mean you'll be putting up my sky dish next week? Or does it mean something more than that? And that's quite key to it. And the, uh, the principles laid down in the charter are accuracy and rigor. So looking into what we do, it's not just a fly by night, a finger in the air. It's actually going into depth, understanding what it is, going back to that knowledge, the theory, asking the right questions and getting it right. It's also into the honesty and integrity, understanding what we do and helping other people understand that, being honest about it, letting them see what we do with openness, Oh, sorry. having the respect for life, law, and the public good, as any decent citizen should do. But again, we're representing an image. I said it before, it's a way of life for us. It's a culture, and we have to take that outside of the office as well as inside, or outside of the plant. And finally, the responsible leadership, listening and informing. And that's leadership in any sense, not the uh, traditional hierarchical sense, but in, in how we present ourselves, all those three above it, do we represent ourselves as good role models, people that can be followed, people that people can look up to? Uh, then we, we see it a lot, the footballers, the celebrities of the day. I don't propose a, I'm an engineer, get me out of here in the woods type thing, but it, we need to be able to present that good image, representing those principles and having something that we can live by. And I looked at today, how are we seen? And there's a phrase that I see quite often in the paper that gets me concerned. Either scientists have said or engineers have said. And when I read those, uh, those first three words, I start to think, oh no, what's coming next? How's this been interpreted? You know, is it going to be nonsense or is it going to be something interesting? Is it actually a well-researched piece? 
But it still concerns me that there's a potential there for those very bad pieces, for the panic to come with what we said. But I'd like to say there is a good news story, and this was an interesting one. And I've, uh, I know I work as a nuclear engineer, I know I'm trained as a chemical engineer, and I know I'm not a rock star. But I have to say, there was one evening, um, I was on a night out with my wife and a couple of friends, and as we were walking home, obviously popped into the chip shop for a quick bag of chips, uh, sustain us on the way home. And my friend got talking to this lad who, fairly normal bloke, you might see him and might be a bit concerned about him if you saw him in a dark alley, but he seemed like, like a nice chap. And he, he mentioned to my friend that he was uh, studying for an apprenticeship in electrical engineering. So my friend said, oh, well, Ben's an engineer. And he came over and started talking to me and he said, he said, what sort of engineer? And I said, well, I'm a chemical engineer by training, but I'm a, a nuclear engineer by profession. He couldn't believe it. It was like he'd met a football star, a rock star. It, it was crazy. I couldn't believe it. Might have been the drink talking, but it was a nice feeling nonetheless. And, and he went on, and I was talking to him, and it was fantastic to see that this, this young man who was going on into the engineering uh, industry held it in such high regard. And we spoke some more, and he asked me if I was a chartered engineer. And I said, yes. <sighs> I had to pick him up off the floor after that. He was shaking my hands, couldn't help it. His girlfriend came over and said how proud she was of him. So it was a fantastic thing to see. You know, this, uh, this lad, 18, 19 years old, going into the industry and getting into that apprenticeship scheme and being proud of what he was doing, proud to go into an engineering profession. And that made me feel really good, actually, I have to say. It was a really interesting evening. My wife will tell you that because I still won't shut up about it. But I make more of a fuss about it than probably she thought. But it was, it was a really nice experience for me to see somebody um, uh, who was really interested and really proud to meet somebody in the profession that he was going into. So in terms of where we are, I think the picture I've tried to paint is that the chemical engineer, I think, today is perfectly prepared to meet the demands of today's world. <laughs> I've mentioned the reasons why today's world is constantly changing. We've seen it's developed over the years, over the past century, the speed of change is increasing and will continue to increase. And we have to be able to adapt to that. We have to be able to innovate and flexibly move from one issue to the next. And I think the experience, the training we have, the education we have, puts us in an excellent position for that. But. I still don't believe chemical engineers are fully understood or utilised. So I've brought my head of engineering here today so I can get them to hire more chemical engineers because I think we're, uh, we're excellent and, uh, and well placed in the nuclear industry to cross a lot of these divides. But I think we still get the issues that, you know, what is it that we do? How can we be of benefit? And I think that's what we need to talk about more. We need to drive that more saying this is what we can do. This is how we can be of service. And I think that goes not just for chemical engineers, that goes in the wider industry, to the public. You know, what can we do? What are we capable of? And as I said there, we need to keep that communication up. We need to keep driving forwards, educating people. But the key to it was that last box I mentioned about becoming a professional engineer. It's continuous. It's a way of life, and you have to continuously look to improve yourself, to build on what you know every day, and to develop yourself every day. And again, coming back to this man, W. Edwards Deming, he has a great um, phrase. He says, it's not necessary to change because survival is not mandatory. And I always hold that in my mind because that's key to me. It, change does frighten us. It frightens us all. But this world is changing, and it won't stop and wait for us. And we have to keep moving with it. And just as a final move on, a final quote for you, um, uh, just to hopefully move us nicely into the, uh, the final part of the evening, looking at the future of chemical engineers. Um, a man called John M. Richardson, Jr., Dr. Richardson, he was uh, a pioneer in global modeling and in system dynamics, and looking at how the future will develop and what we need to do to develop with it. And uh, he's actually been described as one of the world's most effective decision makers. And uh, he said that, when it comes to the future, there's three kinds of people. He says, there's those who let it happen. He says, there's those who make it happen. And there's those who wonder what happened. And the thought I'd like to leave you all with tonight is, which one are we going to be? Thank you very much.